Hello CV Academics Foundation as well as AMP Honors Program members. As some of you may know, my name is Taylor Shively and I'm a part of the What's On Tap feature of our platform. Today I got to spend time with Flight for Life Waukesha's flight paramedic, Caleb, flight nurse, Katie, as well as their program transport manager, Carissa. I hope you enjoy our interview as much as I did. And now I'm here with Caleb. So why don't you start by telling us what a flight paramedic is or even what a paramedic is. Yeah, so that's kind of a somewhat common misconception. A lot of people think of an EMT um, and a paramedic as being the same thing. Um, a paramedic does have to become an EMT. They start at the basic level, then they can move up to being either an intermediate or a full-fledged paramedic. And really what a paramedic does different than an EMT is they'll do things like administer drugs. Um, start IV medications, do certain invasive procedures that an EMT can't necessarily do at a basic level. Gotcha. And then to be a flight paramedic, there's more um, training involved, um, more education to be a critical care paramedic um, because there are other certain critical care skills um, that are required in that particular job. So what do those critical care skills look like or what are those? So some of those critical care skills uh, would entail things like a pericardiocentesis. Okay. Um, for instance, if someone had real bad thoracic trauma mm -hmm. that caused a pericardial tamponade, impeding their heart's ability to pump effectively, Got it. Um, we would actually be uh, trained to place a needle in their heart to yeah. extract you know, any fluid that would be preventing that pumping effectively. Um, that's definitely a critical, scare, critical care skill that uh, is done um, that a, a normal street paramedic typically does not have the training to do. Yeah. Um, we also um, are trained to monitor chest tubes, um, things like that. Some of the other skills as a, par as a paramedic would be like um, a needle decompression. Okay. So if um, someone again had major trauma to their chest, um, uh, collapsing one of their lungs, yeah. uh, we would actually then insert a needle to actually reinflate that lung. Um, and these are skills that are done uh, in a very, very quick manner. Yo, we yeah. have to identify that rapidly. Um, if these are not done, obviously this is life or death. Um, and then there's other things like um, either, either needle crikes or surgical cricothyrotomies. So mm -hmm. if someone has major facial trauma or something to their neck, not allowing us to intubate them by traditional means to ventilate them and take over their breathing, then we would actually cut a hole where their um, cricothyroid membrane is and then insert a tube and breathe for them that way. Find a new airway for yeah. them. Unbelievable. I mean, being in sports medicine as an athletic trainer, you never, you always hear about this stuff and you hear about the athletic trainers in hockey who are army certified and they have all that, but it sounds sure. like that's kind of what you do on a daily basis, which <laughs> is way above me. So yeah. And, and just, um, these skills obviously don't take place every single day. True. Um, but you we, we do have to be trained and we do constantly, um, uh, stress ourselves yeah. so that we're ready for that when it does take place because especially if it's not happening you know five t times out of the week then we want to actually be even more trained and prepared for those situations when they do come about so we're constantly doing training whether it be on mannequins uh, whether it be via you know computer education or yeah. hands-on skills and things like that and now how do you handle that I mean like you walk into a shift like we were just talking about at 7 a.m. like how do you mentally prepare yourself to maybe be in that situation or how do you if you get that call and you're in the helicopter how what's going through your mind when you approach this kind of situation well for anyone that is in this type of field um, anyone knows that this does take um, a, a toll yeah. you know it takes on a, a toll on us both physically mentally emotionally so when we come in um, for a given shift uh, to be prepared mentally and just know that we're okay yeah. for the given shift, that's, that's number one. You know, if there's um, issues, whether someone's dealing with them at home or personal problems or, you know, carrying some extra weight, that, um, that definitely plays a very, very large part in that. So checking ourselves, being honest with ourselves, safety is really number one here at our program. Yeah. So, um, you know, we kind of have a saying that um, you are the person responsible for your safety. Yeah. And, and we live by that. So being mentally prepared is important. And then of course, you know, we do have regular checks um, that we do on a routine basis that keeps us in, a, in that routine. You yeah. know, it keeps us from not skipping a particular step um, so as not to have kind of that hole in the Swiss cheese effect that could lead to um, a catastrophic event. Gotcha. 
And then once you leave your shift, how do you manage to balance your personal and your professional life? Really important to be able to have um, areas where you can kind of vent, you know, and yeah. to be able to just have release, you know, whether, um, you know, it's exercise, you know, I mean, that's obviously, it's very important across the board, but just to be able to kind of emotionally detach from maybe a very difficult call, yeah. um, go ride a bike, go for a run, um, you know, read a good book. Um, I think all of those things, you know, if, if you're into cooking, you know, I mean, just find a hobby, find something that, you know, you enjoy that's not part of your regular medical routine at work. Got it. Something that's completely separate. Um, I think that really does go a long way in helping to kind of give us that, that peace of mind. Awesome. Let's walk over here. Let's get in the shade a little bit, kind of show the bird. Um, what was school like for you? Like what, what motivated you to kind of find this career? What, what was that kickstart? What would start of the domino effect for you? As well, a you know, like a lot of people in my profession, I think um, as a young child, you know, I kind of always revered and looked up to the firefighter. You know, oh, he yeah. was the hero in my eyes. And so initially that was kind of my first inclination was to move towards the fire uh, route. And when I got to be in my senior year of high school, um, you know, I started kind of expressing that to some of my mentors and they said, you know, you should really look into an EMT basic class. Oh, interesting. And I said, well, what's an EMT basic? <laughs> and so as I started figuring out this a little bit more, I was able to actually take a college um, EMT class yeah. um, through the local community college. That counted as high school credits too, so that worked oh, really well. Yeah. Kind of started heading me in the direction that I wanted to go. And as soon as I started that EMT class, I mean, I, I had a whole new passion for medicine. Um, so as soon as I was done with that, worked as an EMT basic for a couple years, uh, and then I went to paramedic school. And from that point on, I kind of just set the idea of firefighting completely on the back burner. In yeah. fact, I never pursued the fire route because I was so in love with medicine and, and physiology and the pathophysiology and how the body works and um, you know, what we can do to have a part in, in helping someone in their most critical situation. And how important was that mentor for you? I mean, obviously they pushed you into that EMT basic class, but do you still keep in touch with that mentor or what else did they do for you along this path that you've so successfully been on? Yeah, and you know, I, I have to say, I don't think it's necessarily one in particular person. There was, you know, some people in the very beginning that kind of just gave me the springboard to find out what an EMT was. Yeah. Um, but I definitely have had a lot of people along the way, even when I was working as an EMT. I'm originally from California, and I okay. worked uh, for a lot of years on a 911 ambulance out there as an EMT, working along with paramedics before I went to paramedic school. And so a lot of the paramedics that I worked with, you know, they'd encourage me to continue my education. Um, if we ran a critical call, you know, I'd be thinking at things from a basic level, and they would help to give me a little bit more insight at the advanced level. And that really just continued to, you know, spark my interest yeah. and, you know, cause me to be a little bit more um, uh, zealous to, to learn more. Did you have a favorite class going up, growing through the process? I, I have to say, you know, anatomy and physiology, you know, okay. really is um, probably my passion. Um, to me, to understand why you're doing something as opposed to just doing something yeah. um, really makes a big difference, you know? That's awesome. And, and, you know, I think in this job, you can know a skill and maybe not know all the intricacies at the very time that you're doing it, but to have that understanding, to really know why you're doing something, that can help change, you know, our ever-changing environment, yeah. you know, at the drop of a hat. So if we feel like we see something that's taking place, that gives us a lot more understanding as to, you know, how we can change our treatment. And so I think anatomy and physiology was definitely my, uh, my favorite class. I loved gross anatomy. I took yeah. anatomy two or three times through college and grad school, and it was every time you learn something new because every professor takes it at such a different angle. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, an amazing course for sure. Yeah. Um, did you have any volunteer or clinical experience that really stood out to you? Or do you feel like that volunteer side um, of your own process was instrumental in you eventually coming here, making it to this point? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, along the way, there's a lot of uh, the training that's involved is clinical time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, ambulance time with a preceptor. Um, I think, you know, all of those different avenues give you different insights yeah. to field of medicine in general. Mm -hmm. um, when I was able to spend time in the uh, hospital, you know, we did different rotations in the emergency room, the operating room, labor and delivery, yeah. uh, respiratory therapy. 
Um, I think probably one of the most influential people in that hospital setting was a uh, anesthesiologist gotcha. and he was in the OR and just, you know, a little Italian guy. And I mean, he just, you know, used his hands and my last name's the Guano, so I could relate to this guy, okay. you know, all right, all right. and, um, you know, he just, he was passionate. He yeah. was passionate about what he did, you know, and when you kind of translate that to the paramedics kind of forte, if you will, the bread and butter, yeah. a paramedic really kind of, um, you know, they kind of, uh, thrive in the airway aspect yeah. of it, you know? And so when you compare that, obviously, I'm not going to put myself as an anesthesiologist, but he was able to really give me a lot of um, insights to, you know, how we should treat the airway, mm -hmm. you know, that we want to be able to um, use particular medications and make sure that we're ventilating appropriately and making sure that certain parameters are in place before we proceed to the next step. And I think that his passion kind of rubbed off on me a little bit. I love that. And so I try to just, you know, uh, imitate that as I, as I continue in my career. Awesome. Um, can you explain a typical call to action for you? Like what from maybe not step one, maybe not like checking the hangar, checking everything on the helicopter itself, but you get that call and you're going through the stepwise process. What is that like for you? Yeah, sure. I'll just kind of go through it briefly, but there are some critical steps that we absolutely take into every uh, situation. You know, the time that the call goes out, we typically have about 10 minutes okay. from the time that the call comes out to the time that we actually lift the skids off the ground. And you may say, wow, that's a long time. You know, I mean, when you're thinking of an ambulance or yeah. a fire engine, you know, responding within five or six minutes of a, of a, um, a patient calling 911, there's a lot that goes into what we need to do in order to actually lift off safely. And again, safety is our priority. So, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's um, we have to collect our blood, we carry two units of O negative blood on okay. the aircraft at all times, that's refrigerated, so we have to pull that out of the refrigerator, place that in the cooler. Um, we do safety walks um, around the aircraft, so we might be looking at different things like um, clips and cowlings, making sure that everything is uh, cinched up appropriately yeah, absolutely. you know making sure that doors are closed you know if something like this was left open obviously that's a no-go oh yeah you know making sure that the doors are not only closed but then that seat belts are not hanging out so when we're doing that walk around everybody's involved in yeah. that that's a very critical aspect of the call we also look for things called fod which is a foreign object de debris gotcha. um, so we're looking for things that could compromise the takeoff of our of our flight and then once we get into the aircraft then we have a, a period of time that we're, we're very quiet. We're just focusing on the, you know, the call at hand. We're using our situational awareness. And then we actually have some challenge and response from the pilot. So the pilot is going to ask the crew member that's in the back, is the litter or is the cot secured? Is there, are there seat belts on? Are the doors closed and fastened? You know, are they ready to fly and things like that? And which, with each um, challenge, they are required to have a response to come back. And so, gotcha. you know, there's some conscious thought that's put into there. If they're not buckled up, they say, no, hold off just a minute, I'm not buckled. You know, so we have to really slow things down almost consciously yeah. so that we don't miss a step because one small move that's wrong in this field, it could mean your life. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Somebody could walk into the, t into the tail rotor and, and that would be tragic. Yeah. So there's a lot that goes, in, goes on involved in just getting off the ground. And as we kind of look around the helicopter and as I'm just kind of visualizing the clips and the seat belts, how long is that checklist, that 10 minute checklist? How many things are you thinking about as it pertains to just taking this off? Yeah, so I would say, you know, give or take, there's probably about 10 or 15 different things okay. um, that are involved in any given checklist. Got it. Um, that we need to kind of mentally go through and make sure that we're not missing. Awesome. Um, how many people are usually on an aircraft with you at the time of a call? So the typical crew configuration is three crew members. Okay. Um, that includes a pilot. So we fly with one single pilot. Yep. Uh, and then we have a paramedic nurse. Got it. And then um, we will, you know, carry other crew members if we have, let's say, an orientee, or sometimes we might fly with a resident doctor from our hospital here that we're associated with. Gotcha. Um, but for the most part, full time, we have a crew of three. Awesome. And I know that the the camera can't see it, but it looks like there's three helicopters. Are there any more that typically come in, come out, or do you guys just maintain three here? So because we are uh, located here at the airport, you know, there's always the chance that another aircraft, even from another program, might utilize our landing uh, zone for maybe fueling up their aircraft. Got it. And that's definitely taken place. On a routine basis, though, uh, we primarily are just using the three aircrafts. This is our dedicated aircraft. Um, okay. This is a EC-145 
uh, twin turbo engine. So this is our primary kind of like, it's the Cadillac of the, of the aircraft. It goes. It, it really goes. <laughs> yeah, she can cook. And then we've got a couple of our backups, our BKs, a little bit older, okay. a little bit smaller, not quite as luxurious, not as much room in the back. Yeah. Um, but we don't want to give them a hard time because they, uh, they're good, good aircrafts and they do the job for us as well. And so are those, those being backups, those would be the one, if this one's gone, you would use one of the BKs. Absolutely. So, okay. um, and it, the aircrafts require a lot of maintenance. Yeah. Um, every uh, so often, you know, they have a they have a schedule, you know, so when we hit the certain hour requirement, um, these will have to go in and either be completely dismantled, transmissions, wow. you know, rotors. Um, basically, even though this particular aircraft is from 2008, mm -hmm. um, everything on this aircraft, short of just the fuselage, um, has been replaced many really? times over. Yeah, so. Interesting. Yeah, okay. so, and, and when they come up for that, then we'll just move into one of our backups. We'll use that for our flights. And then we have our mechanics here all the time. Gotcha. Working on the aircraft doing maintenance. That's unbelievable. I never cons like considered the hour limit that yeah. they would have on yeah. a, a machine as intricate as this. It's, it's pretty amazing. Now, going back to the crew and the number of people and who's all on the aircraft, how does your job other than title differ from that of a flight nurse when in reaction to a call, I would say. Um, really here at Flight for Life, um, we are kind of one in the same. Okay. You know, we work kind of as a well-oiled machine. Um, as a flight paramedic and a flight nurse, we are expected here to be able to perform at the same level. Gotcha. Um, now, traditionally, you know, you may think of a nurse as being in the hospital setting, maybe yeah. in the emergency room or the ICU, and that's where a lot of our nurses have come from. Many of our nurses actually have paramedic backgrounds as well, gotcha. which really, really help them too when it comes to the pre-hospital setting because there's a little bit more uncontrolled chaos, you know, in those settings as yeah. opposed to the hospital. But the majority of our nurses are coming from that hospital setting. So they're well versed in IV pumps, you know, multiple drips on patients, yeah. you know, in that ICU kind of critical care setting. Um, not to say that the paramedics don't have that experience, mm -hmm. but when you compare it to the nurse, the nurse is going to be um, a little bit more versed in that. The paramedic, on the other, other hand, is going to have a little bit more experience in the pre-hospital setting, that gotcha. uncontrolled setting, you know, unstable airways on patients, um, you know, working with fire departments, large mass casualty incidents, you yeah. know, things like that. Um, so together, they really work as a well-oiled machine, but their, their critical skill self level um, is, is really one and the same. So in the conversation of like, what, would you rather know a lot about a little or a little about a lot, you don't really have a choice. You have to know just about everything Absolutely. about everything. Yeah. That's fascinating. Okay. Um, what do you consider the most challenging part of your job? Maybe outside of the calling aspect, the getting calls aspect. You know, I think um, I would have to say probably the most challenging part of this job, which is also one of the probably main reasons what brought us to this job, yeah. is that you really don't know what you're going into. Gotcha. You know, um, most healthcare providers in the EMS setting, you know, we get called, 911 is dispatched, you know, and we, we arrive, you yeah. know, and then from there you make an assessment and, and then you solve the kind of figure out a plan of what you're going to do with your yeah. patient or patients. Um, so I think that definitely tends to be a challenge. Um, but again, that challenge is constantly stressing us to be prepared, yeah. you know, to know our guidelines well, to be prepared for certain situations and be adaptable. So Love I that. think that's what kind of, you know, continues to call us back you yeah. know, each time uh, and motivate us. But I, I would have to say that that probably is a, is a unique challenge. Awesome. Um, what are your thoughts on the importance of teamwork and communication? Obviously, it's crucial to the success of your team as everything is happening. But what about outside of the helicopter outside of a situation, what are the importances of communication? Yeah, I mean, like you said, communication is absolutely key. Without good communication, um, this business would not, it would not succeed. Yeah. So um, outside of this particular environment, it's important too. I mean, our, yeah. we're a family, you know, so we work very closely, um, like I said, 24 hour shifts or 12 hour shifts at a given time. Um, some of our colleagues are around their coworkers more than they are their family. Yeah. You know, and so we do rely on each other. You know, sometimes we're in, um, we try not to put ourselves in dangerous situations, but sometimes those situations might come up on us and be known to us. So, you know, we, we are always looking out for each other. So outside of work, you know, we talk to each other, you know, we try to get together when we can and, 
um, you know, be a source of encouragement to one another. And that's important, you know, because we don't want just that work relationship. We want to be able to feel close enough to our colleagues that they can reach out to us if they've got a personal problem and, yeah. and vice versa. That's awesome. And that's, I mean, that's so important for making or maintaining a good, healthy relationship with work as yeah. it stands. Um, what do you do to relax and unwind? Speaking of that healthy relationship. Yeah, so a little bit uh, about that, like we talked about before, just um, I love to bike ride, you okay. know, love to work out, um, you know, go for a nice jog. Uh, I think things like that just help me to kind of unwind, you yeah. know, decompress a little bit. Um, you know, I'm very involved with my church, you know, okay. just having a faith, you know, just believing in something like a bigger purpose, you yeah. know, I think um, whatever it is that an individual, you know, finds, you know, for me, I just think it's, it's so important because, yeah. you know, you have to believe in it. You have to have a passion for it. And, um, that, that helps me again to kind of just separate sometimes some of the very stressful aspects of work mm -hmm. and be able to know that, Hey, I'm just a human, <laughs> you know, I'm doing the best that I can, Absolutely. but, um, also being able to just find an outlet when you do have a call that maybe didn't go the way that you were hoping it would, or, yeah. you know, the turnout wasn't, you know, as, as good as you wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. Um, in the end, we have to know that we've done our best yeah. and uh, we gave it our best, you know, shot and try not to take that home with you. You know, yeah. we try to just leave those things, you know, at work. Yeah. I, and I can imagine that's difficult, but I, with repetition, I'm sure it comes a little bit easier. In a discussion t um, with future students, where, what advice would you give to them, whether that be on the path to this job or in general? Well, you know, I think a person that gets into this type of a field in um, medicine at all, you know, you have to have, um, you know, you really have to want to help people. Yeah. You know, and I think uh, this is not necessarily the type of job, you know, that I think one would strive for if you're just looking to simply make money. Yeah. You know, because um, that's not what we're in it for. Yeah. You know, uh, you can make a living. You know, and you can support yourself, but that's not why we're here. You know, yeah. most of us are here because, you know, we, you know, we, we grew up wanting to help people, you yeah. know, and, and if, if someone was in a bad situation, you know, we wanted to be there to help them and make it a little bit better. You know, so having that care, having that concern, you know, perseverance, strength, empathy, all of those qualities are absolutely necessary. Yeah. And so if this is something that you're interested in, what I encourage you to do is, um, take an EMT class, you know, yeah. even if you decide to go in nursing or other, some other aspect of, you know, most people can get an EMT class done, an EMT basic class done in a couple months. Yeah. Some classes can be done in a couple of weeks. It gives you some basic understanding of just medicine. Yeah. And I think that will help a lot of people to determine whether or not they can even handle being around sick people. Fair. And, um, that's what I would suggest. I remember that my, I was in grad school and we were doing gross anatomy and we opened up a body the first day and they were like, all right, well, can't do this. Yeah. I'm out of med school. It's yeah. Like, oh, it's yeah. your senior year. So absolutely. It's a rough time to decide. Right. Right. And I would hate for someone to get to that point to finally realize I just can't handle blood or I yeah. can't handle guts or brains, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, just getting, maybe taking small baby steps to get to that point. And then, you know, if you, uh, if you get into the medical field, you know, come do a ride along with us. You know, awesome. if you want to check out the flight world, um, you know, we have a lot more requirements for our crews and experience before they could actually work as a flight paramedic or nurse. But, Absolutely. but to come and just check it out and see like, wow, what this is all about and what do we do on a given day? Yeah. You know, I'd encourage, you know, some that are really looking to uh, determine whether or not this is for them to, to strive for that because that would really give them a much clearer understanding of whether or not this is really going to be the right decision. Awesome. All right, last question. Did you ever consider another career other than flight medic? Um, well, to answer your question, I guess uh, I can go in two different directions with that. Yeah. Um, in the paramedic world, um, I have had the privilege of working in several different capacities. Like I mentioned before, I've worked on a 911 ambulance for a lot of years on the ground before I got into the airfield. Yeah. Um, had the privilege of working in the hospital setting. Um, working in an emergency room uh, with a cardiac specific center as well as a level two trauma center. Okay. So getting that experience was really good. I've um, you know been an instructor and taught in this field. Um, so there are a lot of things that you can kind of put your iron in the fire with as yeah. a paramedic. I will tell you though that before I even got into medicine, um, I love to cook. Oh, okay. And uh, you know I was actually working at a restaurant. I owned my own catering company. So I was kind of thinking about going to culinary school before I got into this. 
and uh, it's kind of a passion of mine, you know, but I think keeping that separate helps me to just kind of decompress, yeah. you know, and, and do something that's totally different than medicine. So I'm happy with the career choice that I went with. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm sure that this is going to go over so well on our platform if people Good. are going to be super excited to learn about it.